Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lukes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. And in this video, we're going to be looking at chapter two. And we are going to, in this lesson, be wrapping this up. We're going to look at heat capacity, and we're going to look at what we do about the fact that we don't have equations of state for solids and liquids. So let's talk about heat capacity. Heat capacity is how we describe that relationship between temperature and internal energy. You've seen this probably before in a chemistry class as 4.184 joules per kilogram or joules per gram Kelvin uh, for liquid water or one calorie per gram Kelvin. Do either of those look familiar? When the system has no phase change, uh, the heat capacity is the energy change per unit mass, per degree of temperature change. And in fact, this is a somewhat common you know, science fair experiment for children where they will build something and they will find the heat capacity of a substance by looking at how much energy change it had with a given temperature change. Um, and they'll do it by comparing to maybe how much ice could be melted, etc. Heat capacity doesn't tell us the full story, though. The way we change the temperature actually makes a difference. It's dependent on the path. If you'll recall in Chapter 1, we mentioned that some properties are path-dependent and some are independent of path. Well, in this case, we have energy changes that are path-dependent. If I have a constant volume process, so a container of something, for instance, then the specific heat at constant volume or the constant volume heat capacity is designated C sub V. It is how U changes with temperature along a constant volume path. So that subscript there, V, indicates the path. And this can be done with either molar or specific internal energy units. For constant pressure processes, we define the heat capacity or the specific um, enthalpy at constant pressure. Okay, C sub P is dH dt at constant pressure. Again, the path is designated by a subscript there. So C sub V and C sub P both sometimes get called heat capacity, but they're not really as generic as one might have thought based on your chemistry experience. Now we've got several different equations, right? We've defined enthalpy as U plus PV and we've now defined CV and CP as the change in U with respect to temperature at constant volume, or C sub P is the change in enthalpy with respect to temperature at constant pressure. And we have the ideal gas law in specific volume terms written as PV equals RT. So what happens if we have a constant volume process? Based on this definition here, U appears to be a function of temperature, but also that path there, volume. So U as a function of temperature and volume, use writing the differential, DU is how U changes with temperature at constant volume times dt, plus how U changes with volume at constant temperature times dV. Now, du dt at constant volume, that is CV. du dV at constant temperature, well, what is that? All I can do is I can surmise that based on 
this for an ideal gas, this must be zero in order for the definition to be correct. Okay. So we often say that du for an ideal gas is CV dt, just a rearrangement of that that we had up above. So delta u is the integral of du for state one to state two, which is the integral of CV dt. Okay. Now, constant volume systems, uh, when do they occur? Well, most closed systems turn out to be constant volume. Usually we've got a container and we're closing it. So closed systems with no moving parts. Right, a part might change the volume somehow, okay? is going to give me delta U is CV DT for an ideal gas. I also remember have that word isochoric. An isochoric system simply says that it is constant volume. So this is going to be what I can do for ideal gases. It's not true for everything, but it is true for an ideal gas. What about if I look at a constant pressure process, something where I leave it open to the atmospheric pressure, for instance, another common application. In this case, based on this, it appears that H is a function of temperature and pressure. Therefore, dH is how H changes with temperature at constant pressure times dT plus how H changes with pressure at constant temperature times dP. And if I do this in specific, put all those circumflex on there. But based on this definition up here, this is C sub P and this must be zero in order for this to be true. So dH is C sub P dt. Now there's another way of looking at this. And that is to say H is U plus PV. Since we've said that it's an ideal gas, then PV is equal to RT. And I need to put a little circumflex on these. And now then, take the differential. DH is equal to DU plus the differential of RT. Well, R is just a constant, RDT. So dH is C sub V dt plus R dt. But we just said that C sub P is C sub P dt is also equal to dH. If I combine these, then what I find is that C sub P is equal to C sub V plus R. So the important results that I found is that for an ideal gas, C sub P dt is going to be dH. C sub V dt is equal to du. If I wanted to know d H extensive, I would multiply by mass. And then I've also learned that I can relate C sub P and C sub V using this equation.
Now, one last topic that doesn't really fit in with any of these others, but we've talked about different models that I can use, equations that I can have for gases, whether it's an ideal gas or I need to use an equation of state. But what about liquids and solids? Okay. Now, generally, these are called incompressible. It's not a perfect definition, but it's close to being true. Incompressible simply means that the change in volume is approximately zero if I change the pressure. Okay? So as I apply pressure, the volume changes very, very little. Now, if a material is incompressible, then I can say that delta U is the integral of CV dt. And delta U is approximately equal to delta H, meaning that CV is equal to CP, or close to equal to. And again, those circumflex. So if this is very good for solids, eh, so-so for liquids, Delta V is equal to zero. This really defines my ideal state. It doesn't matter if I know the volume at one state. I know it for all states. And that I can use delta U or delta H interchangeably for solids and liquids with very little error. And C sub V and C sub P are approximately true for these. We're going to begin applying these in our next chapter when we begin looking at the first law of thermodynamics. Thank you very much for your time.